Hi, everybody. This is Tracy, and today I've got a very special guest for you. Um, Stacy Brookman is a survivor, and she was with a sociopath. Sociopaths are one up level of cray cray from a narcissist. They go the extra mile to destroy you. And um, Stacy's got some great stories she's going to share with us today. Why I've brought Stacy here to help you is for us to see and listen to her ideas about writing down and telling the story of your life. She has started to help people share their life story and she's going to give us a link that's going to get us started. Whether you have it published or not, the benefits that she's going to explain to us today, the benefits to telling your story and sharing it are for you. This is a journaling kind of process that is going to help the memories get out of your amygdala. They're stuck back there now, and they're going to come and they're going to be in the real part of your brain. By writing them, we have so many benefits. So let's give a warm welcome to Stacy Brookman and hear what she's going to share with us today. Thank you, Stacy, for coming. Well, Tracy, I am really thrilled to be here. And thanks for what you do, and I'm glad to be here. Great. Now, what I would love for you to do is just tell our audience a little bit about your experience with a sociopath is what you? Yeah, a real sociopath. I don't bat that word around lightly. And it's a crazy story, as probably many of your listeners have and have heard. So um, about eight eight or 10, eight years ago, uh, I got divorced from a sociopath and it was, I thought it was a, a, originally a quirky, you know, dating this person. And he was a little quirky and which was refreshing for me, but little did I know he really was a sociopath. And when we got married, it was a very tough marriage, a very tough 10 years. And I was one of those type of people, I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, hang in there for the kids. I'm going to, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to be the one that ends this. I want to, you know, exhaust every possible avenue I can to make this a success. Little did I know these people do not change. And I was just digging myself in deeper and deeper and deeper. And, um, when I, but the final step, um, my kids were, uh, seven and nine approximately. And my youngest um, wanted to get on the, our computer. And, and the last straw was she got on the computer and I helped her under the password. It was our you know, desktop computer. And his email was up and an email was there saying a confirmation from Craigslist. And he was advertising himself as a sex toy for couples. And I'm like, okay, that's it. That is the last straw. I mean, he was... <sighs> Uh, horrible to me the whole 10 years. He was um, bad to the kids. He was, uh, but this was the last straw. And I said, you know, I don't want my kids to repeat what I've done is and getting into uh, a bad relationship. I do not. And so I chose that moment to say, to, to take my stand. I'm not going to allow this to happen anymore. So I closed it up, make it, I made it unread. And the next day I went to an attorney. Wow. And um, so that's what started it. And little did I know that the really tough part was coming the following two years, the drug out, divorce, the, uh, the expenses, the, uh, the horrible things that happened, which uh, just, just to give you an example, when um, I was living in a house with my kids, he broke in, cut the wires in Rochester, New York, in the middle of winter, you know, one of the snowiest places in the year. Yeah. Um, cut the wires on my heater and then called Child Protective Services to say I wasn't providing heat for the kids. Wow. Um, and could you prove that? No, no, I couldn't prove it. Of wow. course not. If I had, that would have been great. <laughs> but um, I, don't, I don't know of anybody else who would have done that. Right. I mean, when... I did ask Child Protective Services, I said, was this happen to be my ex-husband? Because when they came, 
the following day I had luckily gotten emergency service and they were, I took pictures and you have know, the cut wires. They weren't like broken. They were cut. Um, and, um, you know, I, and she's, you know, I said, you know, no, we're fine, you know, cause the heater was fine and we were playing a game on the floor and everything. And, and she said, yeah, this sort of thing happens. And I'm like, I know it's, it's him. Um, when we were selling the house that we had together, um, I, I had was gone and he filled all the toilets with feces and cut the wall sconces off. I mean, um, he tried to blackmail me. He tried everything possible to get me to lose my job. And I was the only one paying bills, pr primarily for most of our marriage anyway. Um, he couldn't keep a job for longer than six months. And so every week there was something going on. I always had to be on high high alert to, I mean, he slashed my tires. Um, he stole my computer. He put a, um, a keystroke logger program on my computer. Cause I was on a forum looking at like thinking, okay, this is not normal behavior. What, you know, what, what is this? And I thought it was borderline personality. I was just did a little bit of research and um, I went into the, the forum to kind of ask some questions. And I realized my, you know, avatar had asked some and was giving out advice and saying things like, wait a minute, I didn't do that. He, and then I realized I took my computer and they said, Oh, it's got a keystroke logger program on there. He knows every password that you've ever typed in everything. Wow. And, um, so it was, it was crazy. And I mean, some of the things you just have to laugh at. I, I went to, um, after I went to the attorney and the attorney said, get that computer, take it to a forensic computer place and they will verify that Craigslist posting came from the computer. It'll be a, you know, quick and easy divorce. No problem. Uh -huh. So I said, okay. Uh, I didn't talk to anybody except for my mom in the car on the way home. The next morning I came down, I was going to get that computer. And it was gone. The computer was gone. I had not told anybody. And I was like, my mom wouldn't say anything. I mean, she's like my best friend. I mean, like that wouldn't have happened. So how did he know I went to an attorney? How did he know? And my attorney said, take your car. And, you know, and, and I was like Googling spy stores and Googling, you know, how, how to tell if you there's a bug in your car. And I saw a spy store and I went to the spy store and this guy, he, it was so funny. Um, it, it has, you have to laugh or else you'll cry. And I said, <laughs> is there a way to tell if there's a bug in your car? And he said, he was just real nonchalant. He said, no, but when I sell these things, I tell him to put them underneath the dash. There's, you know, and, and, um, and put them up underneath the dash where there's a, a gap. And so I went out to my car, I felt underneath the dash and there was a wire, a loose wire that dropped down. And I knew, I knew it wasn't part of my car <laughs> because it said Radio Shack on it. Oh my. So I, I drove straight to the police barracks and this police woman came out and she was, it's probably the highlight of her day. <laughs> she, <laughs> she, she comes out and she's like, and, and she knew I thought it was a bug and I had told her why. And so she kept up a running, oh, he must be a uh, pencil dick if he's not, you know, if he's, uh, <laughs> if he's listening, if it's listening device, all oh, the guys that, uh, that do this are incompetent, yada, yada, yada. I'm like, I'm just appalled at her words, but appalled that he might be hearing her words. And then, uh, and so she traced that wire underneath the dash over to the driver's side and up the steering column and open up the steering column. And there's a little bitty microphone right there. Oh my. Recording all of my um, conversations in the car. Oh my gosh. You have had it like so bad. I, it, I can't even fathom it, that. That's just the, that's just a, a fraction of what happened. Like I said, every day I was on um, heightened alert for okay. two years. And, and you had to fight for your life. I mean, yes, every single one of these was, was an attack to you, yes. your children, your home. Yeah. That couldn't have been easy. How did you make it through? Uh, I prayed a lot. <laughs> my, uh, my, I, I would, I have two sisters. I have a brother and two sisters and my mom. And I would call my older sister one day, my younger sister the next day, my mom the next day, because I really thought nobody could take 
all of this, even though I was experiencing all of it, I couldn't, mm-hmm. nobody, and you've got to let that out somehow. Um, but what ultimately happened was I discovered a writing class. And I don't know if you want to tell me to tell about that. That's exactly now. why you are here, my dear, because yes. your story of, of horrific behavior is, is, I think it's, it's probably the highest I've heard um, and the things that he's done to you. But, you know, every little bit of it, I'm sure everyone in the audience has had a taste of, you know, my divorce was a year of horror. Yours was two years. We've all experienced this horrific discard, but it's how we come out the other side that I was so impressed when I heard about what you were doing that I just had to talk with you because everyone wants to tell their story. Everyone Mm -hmm. wants to either get it out, whether it gets published or we journal, that is something that you have built and and I want you to tell us about it. Absolutely. Well, when I, um, I got some money for my birthday uh, in the midst of all this. And when you're in this chronic stress, when you're in this uh, heightened awareness mode, of course, you know what it does to your body, you know, like the cortisol, you start to gain weight. I mean, it's every, and your brain is in fog. It really is. It is, that is not your fault at all. Your brain is in fog. And little did I know he was also um, uh, drugging me with sleeping pills during the day uh, uh, until I discovered that. But that's another, that's just one of many, many stories. Um, so anyway, I got some money for my birthday and I, and I thought, you know what, I want to, he was telling lies. We all know that narcissists, sociopaths, they, they lie, they lie about things they don't even need to lie about. They just lie for the sake of lying. Mm-hmm. And, and court is incredibly difficult. And, you know, the injustices there are incredibly difficult. And so I wanted an account for my kids when they grew up. I wanted them to know the truth. I couldn't speak to them at seven, eight, nine, ten years old um, and tell them about this because it's not right. You're not supposed to do that. I, I did not violate any of that. Um, I did not badmouth him. I would call him out on lies if he, if he was telling them a lie. I, I told them the truth. But I wanted them to hear the truth, the absolute truth of what happened when they got to be adults. And so I took this memoir class at Writers and Books in Rochester, New York. And my uh, instructor, Anais, was amazing, amazing. She knew the healing power of writing. So every week I would write, hey, here's the crazy things that happened to me this week. I mean, he broke into my car, he, you know, he stole some this, that. Um, he stole every bit of the kids' childhoods. Um, all the scrapbooks that I had put together, all the, I mean, you stole everything out of the house over the course of a year. So I was writing down these hurts. I mean, these things that were going on and an amazing thing happened. I started realizing that number one, he's not going to get better. When you put the things that are happening to you from your head that are rolling around in your head and you put them down in black and white, either in you know handwriting or on your computer, there is something that happens right there. You have to find the words for what happened to you instead of just um, you know thinking through those things in your head. Um, you have to, you see very clearly what's happened. You see very clearly your role in what's happened. And what I discovered is I had a life theme and my life theme wasn't one that I liked. My life theme was I didn't raise my hand my entire life from kindergarten, grade school, uh, uh, into adulthood. I didn't say that's not right or don't treat our kids like that. Or, you know, it's not right for you to steal from your employer. Or I, I didn't, <sighs> up for my, so, oh my goodness, we had desks and I mean, th- oh, there are things that came through our garage that were, when my husband did, my husband did that too. He, when he left, there were 14 brand new laptops. I believe it. were just what he left behind. They were like still in packages. Yes. From his employer. And I was like, what oh, they all go from the same playbook. Believe <sighs> me. It's crazy. So <laughs> when I was, when I was writing these things, first of all, when I went to the writing group, I found people who didn't judge me. They held my story without contempt. 
they mm-hmm. held my story and um and and my heart i mean there were a wide variety of of people there and you know at times i would i would read my story everybody else, everybody read their stories uh two pages every friday and i was able to hear their stories and i was able to tell mine and people heard me and people you know understood and and empathized with me and just for somebody to hear your story um is just amazing and so we were taught how to write what's happened to you into a beautiful story into a nice story and so organically i really i discovered the benefits of writing Uh i got they love my stories so much actually they gave me a scholarship to come back the next semester Yay. Which was fun and also validating. Um, but, and, but also after that, I started looking into this. I'm like, everybody needs to know. You don't even have to worry about grammar or punctuation or structure or the right words. Just get it out. Just get it out. And um, what happens is after, afterwards, I did some research and into the art and the psychology of life storytelling. And I started teaching it at my local community college in, uh, when I was in Houston. But what happens is when you experience trauma, your brain puts those memories in a certain part of the brain, a part of the brain where those memories do not fade. They can get triggered at any moment from a certain smell or a certain sound of uh, a music, a song, mm-hmm. um, someone saying something, Hey, Hey, how are you? And that, that itself could trigger something. Um, yeah. So, what happens is that it's very sharp, but it hides from you. It hides from you until it comes out. And then In the amygdala, like, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Very much so. And, and there's a lot of research that what happens when you write is it takes it out of that, uh, that part of the brain that causes problems and it puts it in the part of the brain where regular memories are stored, where they can fade just like regular memories. And that's the beautiful thing. So they, you, they lose their power over you. I don't know, you probably felt, and a lot of your listeners probably feel very scared. Even when you're out of that situation, you are afraid, afraid of you know, what could happen. And, and you're, you're, you're still on heightened awareness. Mm-hmm. And writing helps you calm your brain down. It's, yeah. it's almost like meditation. And I, help, I, I tell people they should meditate also. Um, but writing find, helps you find the words and it helps you find, uh, I hate to say this, but your role in it. My role is I didn't, you know, I didn't see the red flags, but when I saw the red flags, uh, early on, but when I started seeing the red flags, I didn't call them out. I was afraid. I, my, my part of that was, I didn't say, no, that's not right. right. Why are you stealing from your employer? Why are you treating me this way? I don't, right. I don't choose to be treated this way. And and that's what we all have. I I look back, that is my accountability was not being um, a self-advocate. You know, they ask me to lie and lie for them and pretend that this and that. And I go, why did, why was I so compliant? Yes. And it was fear, but it was also about fitting in. It was like, okay, this is how this family operates. And, right. you know, they would tell me as a member of this family, this is how you have to do it. You know, right. I have to lie. I just said, oh, okay. And, and inside of me knew that wasn't right. Right. That exactly. started the, 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 you know, pain. Well, then you feel guilty because then you have been complicit and they use that against you as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, like you've already done so much. Why not to go further? You know, it's, exactly. it, it, they really entangle you. Yeah. Uh, and then we all, all, every one of the people that are going to listen to this have experienced this. So thank you so much for sharing about that because, yeah. um, we all feel the same way. And, yeah. um, I love that you have brought it even one step farther. So you've you've started teaching classes at a community college. college. And now what are you doing with this wonderful project? Well, as you can tell, I'm really passionate about this. I love it. And I wanted everybody, everybody to know the benefits of writing about your life story and getting that out and getting not only you don't ever have to publish. um, It's beneficial, but you can. Um, so I teach, I, I thought, you know, I was teaching, uh, 
15, maybe 18 people at the community college in a class, and I wanted more people to learn about this. So I put up a website, it's stacybrookman.com, and I there I have a podcast called Real Life Resilience, and I teach people how to be more resilient, and I have um, a webinar that I do every month, it's called The Four Simple proven methods to writing the very first chapter of your life story in just seven days. Because sometimes people think, oh, I got to write my whole life story. But no, you don't. Just get started on that very first chapter. And I teach you, walk you step by step through it. And it's, it's free, completely free. And then I give you the tools to go with to um, chapter two and beyond. But when you start doing that writing, you're going to discover, and then you can be compassionate to yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the beauty of writing is you can see, okay, here's what's happened. Yeah, I did play a role in accepting that, but you, you, you're compassionate to yourself, your former self, your, your old self and say, you know what, you you didn't know any better and that's okay. Let's move on from here. Mm -hmm. And so writing your story is, is so beautiful. There are a lot of Uh, research studies done on writing. Uh, Dr. James Pennebaker from the University of Texas at Austin has done a lot. There's just tons all over the United States, all over the world, really. But what he did was he had, he's done several, but one of them was he had people with chronic pain write about, you know, their daily tasks. So I've got to go to the grocery store. I went to the grocery store and, and half of them wrote about a traumatic event. Mm. And the people that wrote about the traumatic event um, lowered their pain, lowered their uh, chronic pain. And because uh, there, it's something in your brain changes when you write about those and you get those memories out of that you know, traumatic part of your brain and into the regular part where they can fade. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's what I teach people to do. I teach people to do it for themselves. I do encourage people to share because what if someone was just about to go through what you went through, or maybe they're in the midst of going through what you went through. Wouldn't you want to help them? So I do encourage people to share. Um, It's embarrassing sometimes, you know, uh, because you were complicit for a little while or you were, you know, you, you know, I was a professional woman. I, at one point, he was turning off the water. We, we, we lived together because the, at first the courts didn't make either one of us move out. And so we were getting a divorce, but living in the same house. Horrible, horrible for the kids. Um, but whenever I went to use the water, bath, shower, sink, whatever, he would turn off the water. And then the kids would have to go ask him, hey, I'm going to take a bath. Can I go, you know, can you turn on the water? He would turn the water on for them and, and then, then turn, turn it back off. off. And so I would... I would have to use their bath water. I would have to, ultimately, I would go to the grocery store nearby in the mornings, wash my hair, wash my face, put on my makeup at the grocery store in order to go to work. And I was a professional woman. When you, if you looked at me, you would not be able to tell what a chaotic life I was living at that time. Wow. And that's embarrassing. I mean, it's well, there's shame. There's shame. There is shame. People find shame. out and vulnerability that right. you didn't know. And, and then the questions, yeah. you know, someone, the Me Too movement and the why did she stay? Exactly. I, question. I know why people stay. I know why people stay. Yeah. And, yeah, and then you would get the questions, why, why are you still there? You know, and the judgment. Mm-hmm. I get it. I yeah. Get it. Um, but by writing me, it down, we open up our hearts. For me, yes. you know, doing this YouTube channel really has helped me purge a lot of that stuff. And right. what's happening is it's it started out as, you know, victim. Oh, this happened. Oh, you know, and you're right. in that. You're in that hot. You're in that crazy, you know, foggy brain thing. And then you start to look at it and you analyze what was my accountability? Mm-hmm. What did right. I miss? Mm-hmm. And you know, when we talk about accountability, so many people are, are, are afraid to take accountability and they're not going to move on because there is something and, and you, right. you will do it again. That means you're going to be complacent <laughs> and not stand up for yourself the next time. Right. And I find that, that the level of 
dangerous people get worse and worse and worse. Like if, right. if we took it from this guy, the next person is going to try and push harder until you're in a situation. I work with the domestic violence council here and until you're in a situation where you've escalated mm -hmm. the amount of crap you're going to take. Right. And, and you end up getting beaten and you know killed if if it gets that far. Okay. So we yeah. have to stop the the insanity. Stop the insanity and yeah. listen to our little girl voice or our little guy voice. Yeah, right? and that's something with writing you can do is is absolutely yourself, right. And be kind to yourself and say, you know what? It's I I get it that I didn't. Um, stand up for myself and be compassionate because what we're doing is we're replaying our childhoods. We're replaying all the, the hurts, the heartache and, and the desires that we had as a child and we're replaying them as an adult. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've uh, gone to the Allender center and done a story workshop with them. It was oh so powerful and they're really big on, okay, let's talk about your childhood. I'm like, oh, I had a great childhood, a fine childhood. It was okay. And no problems there. Move along, move along. You know, but <laughs> <laughs> nothing but to see, I, nothing to see. Yeah. So, but we, we do as human beings, we have a huge capacity for pulling the wool over our own eyes. Uh -huh. And when you write, you take that wool off, yeah. but you can say, okay, to that eight year old child that you, that desires a, a relationship with somebody, you know, that um, 15 year old who was, you know, made fun of, you know, you can say to that person, it's okay. I love you. It's going to be all right. And you can, when you're writing, you care for that person. You care for that younger you and you can move on. So what we're, what we're doing when we get these really bad relationships, we're recreating that. We're trying to improve the life that we had or what we had when we were younger and you can't do that, mm -hmm. but you, but you're doing that with your eight year old or 15 year old mind. And you've got to do that with your 40, 50, 60 year old mind Yeah, and with wiser. You look back with wiser much wiser eyes. And that's yeah. wisdom is a good thing. And then you use that wisdom to move forward. So when I discovered my life theme was not holding up my hand, not saying no, I was able to change it. I'm like, I don't like that life theme. I don't want to be like that. And I was able to change my life theme and my life is beautiful now. I love it. Yay. And how long have you been free from the crazy? Eight years, eight, eight years. years. Well, my kids are still uh, 17 and 18. Okay. So, uh, so they're going one more year, I think. And then I don't have to have any more contact. Wow. <coughs> Bless you. Excuse me. Um, uh, so, so yeah. can I ask like one little question because mm -hmm. it's, you co-parented after all of this, how hard was that to send your kids oh. off to a, a, a person that was so abusive to you? It was incredibly difficult because I knew they were abusive to, he was abusive, emotionally abusive to them, not physically. Um, he would, he hated me so much that he, when the kids would, um, the, ju the, the judge allowed me to move out of state, which is extremely rare. They wow. ultimately, the courts ultimately saw it was in the kids' best interest for wow. us to move. And so we moved. Like, like my, my attorney said, you better move soon because he could get an injunction and stop what the judge said or whatever. Within two weeks, I was gone. Sold everything. Friends helped me just do an auction of the house, furnishing everything. I was gone. Wow. And um, so what happened was he, he, they had to go back three times a year. And um, I had to pay for two. He quit his job. So he would say, I don't make any money, yada, 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 yeah. which is ridiculous, <laughs> of course. But um, he would... Uh, they each had their own little cell phone. He would take their phones, not let them talk to me the whole time. And this is like 10, 11 years old. And, and I'm like, they are, they just came over on a plane and they're, you're going to like not let them talk to me. That's not right. Yeah. And um, he, he took the uh, batteries out. Um, a couple of times I went with them and, you know, did the, did it by car exchange and he, he was like, we don't, we don't need, don't send him with anything. Or he would tell them, he wouldn't speak to me directly. He said, tell your mom to take your suitcase back. You don't need it. I'm like, well, their toothpaste, their, you know, allergy medicine, their, nope, I have everything they need. He refused to have anything that was from my house wow. at his place. 
Probably because yeah. he thought you were going to like bug, you know, the time. No, I think it's just that <laughs> psycho weird, you know, any, yeah. anything that I've touched is, is poison. And, you know, cause it's like either I win or you win and he, right. There's no middle, no yeah. middle. He would buy them Christmas presents, um, uh, clothes, a chocolate monopoly set, um, and for Christmas and then send them off without them because he's like, Oh, these clothes need to stay here. This stuff needs to stay here. I'm like, by spring break, they had grown out of them. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like what good is it if you're going to buy these things, if they're, if you're not going to let them use them, right. but he didn't want anything that he bought at my house. Oh. I mean, just, just so co-parenting was incredibly, incredibly difficult. Uh, it, in fact, he married another person in New York. I don't know if we have time for a little, another. Yeah, yeah, one. totally. In New York, the first person who files the paperwork has to sign the final paperwork. Okay. And when he got that computer, I went to the, my attorney and she said, go to the courthouse. Here's how you file. I went there. He had been just been there like 10 minutes before me. Yeah. So he filed first. So in the end he had to sign the paperwork, but he refused because he thought if uh, he signed the paperwork, he would have to start paying child support. He's never paid a dime not a dime in child support eight years. Wow. Um, so anyway, but he uh, quickly got another victim mm -hmm. and quickly married her, got her pregnant. And, but he was still married to me. I was not away from, I, I couldn't escape. We were still married, which is weird. He convinced the uh, a preacher and the county clerk that, oh, it was just a mistake in paperwork. We're really divorced. Like, no, we're not, we're not divorced. Wow. And so f for, a, uh, I, my attorney, by then I was in Texas and my attorney said, go to the police there. You're going to have to file bigamy charges to get him to, to sign the paperwork. And how embarrassing was that? I'm in my new community with my mom and dad, living with them for a little while. And I had to go to the police department in Azle, Texas and say, I, my ex-husband, won't sign the paperwork. So I got to file bigamy charge, which is, is a felony. And wow. so they actually pursued him for a year for you. They got with the police in New York. They tried to get him. Finally, they were able to uh, catch him and get him in their office. And they said, listen, if you don't sign these papers right now, we're taking you to jail on bigamy charges. Wow. A year. So oh. that was essentially a three-year divorce. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And, yeah. So yes, co-parenting was crazy, but you know what? I, I kept giving my girls really good, um, parenting on my side. I mean, I knew that's the only thing I could do. Right. Um, I mean, when we left psychologically, it was so damaging. He said, Oh, your dog misses you. Your teachers miss you. Your friends miss you. That's not what you do when your kids are away. You say, hey, I hope you're having fun. And, right. and you know, you, you want to help them, you know, um, adjust to their new new place. And he was not about, it was all about him. Um, so, but I'm happy to say they are both, they're 17 and, uh, and 19, 18, and wonderful, beautiful girls. And I've been able to have the most, majority of influence on them. That's good. And, uh, that's, so that's what I was going to ask you was, how they had turned out in the end. Did they ever read your story? Uh, one of them has, and one of them hasn't. Okay. One of them doesn't, doesn't want to, and that's okay. That's yeah. perfectly okay. The yeah. other one. And uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Well, uh, one day, yeah. one day, it, yeah. it, you know, we have to change the patterns for our children. And a yes. lot of people don't realize that they're watching and, mm -hmm. and they are, um, creating the patterns of their life that yes. they're going to do and they will repeat what they've seen yeah. if, if we don't give them the right tools and teach them boundaries and so forth. Yeah. I think we, we, we kind of sometimes get that martyr complex. Oh, I can handle it. You know, it's not that bad. He's not um, beating me. Um, right. I, I, you know, I, it's okay. I can survive. I'll handle it. But what you are doing is you are teaching your kids. It's okay for somebody to treat you like that. And they're, somebody, they're going to find somebody to treat them like that. And when I couldn't get out for myself, mm -hmm. I was able to get out for my kids. I did not want them to have a life like that. In fact, I'm tearing up because I, 
did not want them to experience what I experienced. And, and that is what makes you a great mom. <laughs> it's putting their needs and putting your oxygen mask on first exactly. so that you can change so true. their future. And, and right. it's a hard thing to do, but when we love our children so much, mm -hmm. we need to protect them because yeah. when you're in this kind of relationship, if you are just worrying about yourself and not worrying about the kids, um, look at, you know, look at me and, and, how I ended up being a narc magnet. Yes. I was so, right. I thought I was being kind and nice and sweet and helpful. And, you know, all of these things were actually detrimental to my health because I should have raised my hand. I should have said, exactly. I will not lie for you. And I think that's why I got a divorce because I finally said, I'm not going to do this anymore. Right. And so that no, was no yeah. matter how nice you are, no matter how good you are, your goodness will not change that person. Yeah. And even if you don't have kids, you need to get out for yourself. You are worth getting out of yeah. that. You don't deserve I know. that type of relationship. Nobody does. No. And I think writing it down empowers us. Yes. So absolutely. I'm going to encourage everybody to go to your stacybrookman.com. We'll put the URL at the bottom and in the comments and the, and the description down below, we'll put your website and um, the link to where they can get started on how Fabulous. to do this. And I really thank you so much for coming here today and sharing your story because in every single story, someone finds a nugget that makes that aha moment happen for all of us. And so right. you are brave and I respect you so much for what you're doing and enabling and empowering people is, is a really good thing. Thank you, Tracy. And I do hope so I teach and help so many people get out of their abusive relationships um, and recover from whatever trauma that they have. And Tracy, thank you for doing this because if you didn't do this, so many people wouldn't hear the message. And um, I really appreciate what you're doing in the world. Thank you very much. And we will see you soon.